Empower Radio presents Welcome to Blissville with the Bliss Lady, Terry Williams. Get ready to connect with inspiring, motivating, enlightening, and joyful guests who are following their bliss. Now, here's your host, Terry Williams. Hey. Welcome to Blissville Indeed. You know, um, to me, one of the key elements to living my own bliss is living simply. A few years ago, my husband and I made a pact to live more simply, to scale down on stuff and just be more. Well, my guest today, Tammy Strobel, did that and a whole lot more. I mean, she radically simplified her life, and she's going to share a little bit about that. Um, In the course of radically simplifying her life, she came up with an awesome plan and a groovy book called You Can Buy Happiness and It's Cheap, How One Woman Radically Simplified, man, I just love that, radically simplified her life and how you can too. So uh, welcome to Blissville, Tammy, and how do we radically simplify? (laughs) Oh, thanks for having me on the show. (laughs) Um, How do you radically simplify? Just let go of some of your stuff. (laughs) It doesn't have to be super hard. Well, you know, uh, my husband and I really did make a pact a few years ago um, to to change our lives drastically. And in viewing your book, some of the things that spoke to you spoke to us as well. But but really, what I loved about your topic is you can buy happiness. I mean, we're so pre-programmed to believe that money can't buy happiness. And I think that what you're saying is we need to change how we look at it. Yeah, definitely. And a lot of the happiness researchers talk about how you can literally buy happiness. Of course, you know, it's important to have your basic needs met, to have a roof over your head, to have food and all of that. But if you have excess income, you know, rather than running out to the mall and buying more stuff, you could opt to spend that on a vacation or maybe a yoga membership or like books, like little things that might bring you joy on a daily basis. Well, one of the things that I read in in your book, okay, so let me just backtrack for one second. Mm -hmm. Um, Basically, you share your story um, in each chapter, and at the end of it, you have these micro actions, which I absolutely love. (laughs) And uh, one of those micro actions was waiting 30 days before you buy stuff. So you're talking about, yeah, you can, you can do things, but, but what, you know, what does that mean? You know, wait 30 days. How do we step into that? Sure. Well, it, it's something that really helped me, like, because I was really into shopping and um, buying stuff. And um, as we were trying to pay off our debt, my husband Logan and I adopted that rule just because, you know, if I wanted a new pair of shoes, for example, I just waited the 30 days and was like, okay, well, do I really need another pair of shoes or can I get by with what I have. And that just really, it made me be more mindful about my consumption patterns and just to kind of take stock of what I really had at home before running out and buying something. I love that uh, terminology, consumption patterns. Um, You also talk about uh, something that really changed your life. And that was a trip that you took to, is it Zapatista? Uh, Yeah, we went to Chiapas, Mexico and uh, visited the Zapatistas. And at that time, I was volunteering with the Mexico Solidarity Network. And I was really shocked by the poverty I saw and just the living conditions. And I really felt like kind of a jerk when I got back home because I realized how much I had and that I wasn't really... Um, being very grateful for that. You know, there are a lot of people who don't have their basic needs met in this world. And so that was very eye opening for me. I uh, worked with a friend this weekend and I'm, I can't, can't wait to give her your book. Um, She had called me and asked me if I would help her um, kind of scale down some things in her house. And she had said she recently went to church and they were talking about gluttony. And Mm -hmm. she realized that 
she wasn't an overeater. Her gluttony came up in the form of stuff. I mean, she's, she's, uh, God, if she's listening, she's going to kill me for sharing her story. But, <laughs> um, you know, she's a QVC and HSN junkie uh-huh. and she's got so much stuff and people just don't realize that that stuff can totally stress you out. Yeah, definitely. And personally, I, I can relate to your friend's story just because um, uh, when I was shopping a lot, I was shopping to kind of mask emotions that I wasn't dealing with. And I mm-hmm. think that can be true for any um, mild or severe addiction. It's like, you know, like maybe you drink a little too much to kind of deal with stress at work. And for me, I was heading to the mall to deal with my stress and that's not Mm -hmm. very healthy. So as we've simplified, I've really changed my patterns. And now instead of shopping, I go for a bike ride or for a walk and those things are free and fun. (laughs) Well, you also mentioned in there that one of the your inspirations was the 100 thing challenge. Mm-hmm. My uh, husband shared that with me um, a while back. I haven't gone. I haven't tried it yet. I'm I'm <laughs> I've got some fear around that. But mm-hmm. tell me, to, let's talk about that. What what is the 100 thing challenge, and why'd you try it? Well, I I'm trying to remember how. I, I think I found Dave Bruno's blog just kind of when I was surfing around on the internet. And Dave Bruno is the guy who started the 100 thing challenge. And basically the idea is to pare your personal belongings down to under 100 items. And I was really inspired by what he did and Um, I was like, oh, this would be a really cool way to downsize even further. And so I kind of just went for it. And um, I think, you know, the important thing to remember about the challenge and, and Dave talks about this, too, is that it's really an exercise in mindfulness and really just kind of being aware of those consumption patterns that I mentioned earlier. So like, If you're going to start the challenge, like make up, make up your own rules. Like for example, Dave counted his personal library as one thing. So, Mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of like figure out what's important to you and then go from there. And, um, how, like, how did it work in your relationship? How did it affect your husband's name is Logan, right? Right. So were you like both on board with this, um, and and how can people transition through that? Like, what if one doesn't want to and the other one does? Sure. Well, with simplifying, like it was actually Logan's idea to begin with to kind of scale back. And I didn't want it. I didn't want to do it at all. So (laughs) I was totally the resistant partner. But we had a lot of conversations about uh, downsizing and really just talking about what we wanted from life, not only um, in our relationships, but in our work and kind of looking at um, our lives holistically. And the more we talk, the more I realized like, well, I might as well give this a try. And like Logan always said, the worst thing that happens is we move into a bigger space. Like life is an experiment. So just kind of having fun with it. Yeah, well, it, it definitely is. And, um, I kind of can relate to that. My husband and I went from, Oh, a 2000 square foot home and, down to the last home that we lived in was 750 square feet. And we have uh, five children. Now, mind you, only one of them lives with us. Uh But uh, it's a 21-year-old. And like you, she's... She find relieves her stress with shopping. Mm -hmm. And so (laughs) it was really a challenge to say, okay, we don't need this. We need this. You know, how can you look at it and be more mindful? Because it wasn't just my husband and I, it was my daughter as well that we really had to pull into this 
kind of new new way of thinking. It's an old new way of thinking, though, isn't it? Yeah, I think I think you're right on that. And, you know, it's definitely, I think, probably more challenging if you've got kids. And in the book, um, I talk about my friend Courtney Carver, and she recently downsized her life and um, kind of her husband and daughter slowly kind of got on board with the idea. And um, something I always kind of consider Sitter is just kind of talking about options with people instead of telling them what to do, just because I feel like if if you tell folks you have to do X and Y, there's a lot of resistance to that. And I know personally, I can be resistant to like being told what to do. So just kind of being presented with options, I feel like makes transitions a little bit easier. I Yeah, I think that's really important. Um, and for me personally, that, that became a learning experience as well with my own daughter. You know, my husband and I were pretty much on board with each other, but with my own children, it became, it, you know, it just became important to say, okay, this is one way you could do it. And she's she's got her own little space, so she's good, but, uh, it's definitely a challenge, definitely a challenge. Um, One of the things that I read in the book was uh, how you really became um, an economist, you know, as you went through college. And I kind of think of you now as a happiness economist. (laughs) That's cool. (laughs) Yeah, you know, it's it's funny because I got my degree in economics and then ended up in the investment management industry. And I just realized like, oh, this is not for me. I had to get out of that field just because I, I... it was really unhappy and it wasn't a good fit professionally. So I'm much happier with uh, what I do now, which is writing and photography. And it's just really fun. I feel lucky to do work that I love. Well, I think that that's a key to happiness really is, is doing what you love and simplifying can really help you be in a space to do more of what you love. So um, let's uh, let's jump on that for a second. Talk about photography. What what are you doing with that? <laughs> sure. So I'm I'm teaching an e course um, in the new year. That's it's called How to Capture Everyday Magic with Your Camera. And so, in a lot of ways, um, the photography is kind of a mix of like um, learning technical skills, but also it's really kind of about seeing the world and really noticing what's around you because for so many years, I just kind of rushed through my daily life and um, I didn't notice like the changing of seasons and just like these little things that I pass by now. And I feel like this compulsion to take photos of. So it's been um, a great thing for me just taking photos. Um, I just feel a lot more mindful when I've got my camera in my hand. I can relate to that too. My husband's a photographer and I mean, he's taught me a few things and it's amazing what you can, as you said, capture when you become open to it. So have you created um, space in your home and, you know, in your life then to do more of these things and to really get out there and um, focus It's like, do you have a photography studio and... No, I don't have a photography studio. I mean, I'm mainly, um, I don't know, I... I guess I I should call myself kind of a writer, photographer, teacher, because a big part of my kind of job is writing. And I also teach e-courses. And then the photography is becoming um, a larger aspect of my life. And I'm not sure where that's going to lead me. Um, It's just kind of been this big adventure. And so it's kind of neat that way. And since I have my own little writing business, I have a lot of flexibility in terms of, you know, what kind of projects I take on, which is pretty amazing. Well, and you're a strong um, proponent of community work. You talk a lot about, you know, being in community and helping people out. Um, Do you find that through simplifying, you have more space to do that? 
Yeah, definitely. And I kind of am in transition right now. I'm actually looking to start engaging more in volunteer work because we moved in September from Portland, Oregon to Northern California. And there were a lot of reasons behind the move, but um, I'm kind of like getting to know my new local community and I'm like, Oh gosh, what am I going to, what, who am I going to volunteer for? So that's really exciting. And um, now that we've been here for a few months and are getting settled, I'm looking forward to doing something with the extra time that I have. And so how would you, um, how would you encourage other people to go out and do those things? You know, what are some of the steps that they can take to start living, living their own passions? Sure. Well, I think, um, I would consider doing this thing. It's called kind of time tracking. And I talk about this a little bit in the book. Um, when I was trying to reprioritize what I wanted to do with my time, I printed out a Google calendar and basically tracked my time for, um, two weeks. And I noticed like all these blocks where I thought I was really busy, but I wasn't (laughs) like I was doing stuff like, Mm -hmm. you know, around on Facebook or watching TV. And I decided to kind of X out those activities. I mean, I, I still go on Facebook. It's just not for maybe it's like a half hour a day or 15 minutes rather than two. <laughs> and so, you know, noticing that and being like, well, instead of TV watching or Facebook, and I can go volunteer. And so, you know, I think we all have those time gaps. It's just a matter of kind of figuring out what that looks like. And then, um, you know, if you're, for example, thinking of changing jobs, maybe you start volunteering with um, an organization that you might want to work for, or just getting a little more experience that way. And it can be not only a benefit to you, but to the organization. So there's all kinds of options, but tracking your time is a great way to get started. Well, and it's really amazing that uh, how um, you find opportunities. You don't look for them when you're out building community and working in the community and volunteering your time. You don't necessarily look for opportunities, but it's amazing how opportunities can happen. Um, I have a friend, her and I were both uh, downsized, more to make a long story short, right? Mm -hmm. We were both downsized a couple of years ago and um, came up with a project that we decided to work with um, for one of our local organizations here is to raise backpacks for the homeless. Mm -hmm. And um, from that experience, both of us picked up, you know, new clients and new opportunities to work with people that we would have never met had we not been in that same, you know, in that, in that space of, of volunteering our time. And neither one of us looked at it as that type of an opportunity, but it was a beautiful experience in that it brought that to us. Yeah, it's, I've had that kind of similar experience in that, you know, just going out and volunteering with an organization and then um, being asked to like do web design work and, you know, or writing some freelance articles. It's just been, it's so cool in that way. It's just kind of, I think, all about being open and uh, going from there. So, yeah. Okay, and one thing that that we didn't really talk about that I wanted to talk about is um, let's talk more about that tiny house. What does that mean? I mean, what you talk about it being a movement too. So let let's talk about that a little bit. Sure. So we live in a really tiny house, and it's um, it's more it's kind of like a cabin, but it's on wheels. So the house is 16 feet long, it's eight feet wide, and it's 13 feet tall. And so um, to kind of uh, give listeners a perspective, it can literally fit into like a car parking space. And so um, it looks like a little cabin, but it's mobile and um, it, it meets our needs. Like we've got a little sleeping loft and a small kitchen and um, a pull-out bed for guests. Um, 
and you know, not everyone wants to live in a super tiny space and that's totally fine. But for our particular situation, it's been so great. Cause like, you know, we had just moved from Portland to Northern California and we were able to just take our tiny house on the road. <laughs> so that was really fun. And, um, it's been just a neat experience living in the space so far. And what do people think when they, or say, you know, like when they see you pull up, have you gotten, I bet you've gotten some crazy feedback. Well, you know, people, as we were driving from Portland to California um, and stopping at like rest areas for breaks, yeah. people were just fascinated by this little house. And they're like, what is this? You know, is it an RV? Like, <laughs> and it, <laughs> it is similar to an RV, but um, it's built for year round use. And then, you know, it has a cabin look. So it's, it's very different in a lot of ways. But, um, you know, I would say most people have been really supportive of, you know, this idea of living in a tiny space. And, um, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, the feedback's been good and overwhelmingly positive. So that's and nice. And what do you like most about living in it? Um, oh, so many things. I feel like so connected to my surroundings. Um, like, when you're sitting in the house from any vantage point, you're looking out a window, which makes the space feel larger. And it's just really cool because I feel like I see more of nature and just kind of notice things that um, I didn't when I was living in an apartment. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of nice. And I love the sleeping loft. It's really cozy. <laughs> Well, and you have pets, right? I, yeah, we have two. <laughs> we have two cats, and uh, they—they're really cute. They love the space. <laughs> Well, listeners, we're talking with um, Tammy Schrobel, and I say you have pets because she's got an amazing website called Rowdy Kittens. It's really a blog, um, and it's very cool. Along with her book, you can you can buy happiness, emphasis on the can, and it's cheap through radically simplifying. Um, Tammy, what is your definition of happiness and simple living? Oh gosh, it's for me, it's really, it comes down to just noticing where I'm at and just being in the present moment. Um, you know, like I was saying earlier, I've rushed around for so many years that um, just being able to kind of sit still and, you know, just enjoy where I'm at in the moment has been um, a really nice thing and a big change for me because it's like, um, I'm not always thinking about like what I have to do. It's like earlier I had a great lunch with my husband and we were just enjoying the view and the sun. And I guess it boils down to just being grateful for the little things and being present. Yeah, um, I hear you on that. We had a house fire 11 years ago and um, it's amazing how how you realize it's just stuff. And you can really connect and be grateful for all those little things in life, right? Yeah. Um, you, unfortunately, we are down to the wire and um, and ready to, to close out our show here. It has been totally awesome having you with me here today. Uh, I can certainly testify to the fact that simplifying your life can add more joy. Um, I love to have my guests leave the listeners with one or two thoughts that they can take with them to to bring more joy to their life. What, what would that be for you, Tammy? Um, well, a couple things. I would just say, you know, go out to dinner with your spouse or your mom or dad and just um, have a good time or make dinner at home and just be with them in that moment and maybe go for a walk and notice the fall leaves and um, enjoy the nice weather if if you've got some in your area. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you again for being here. Um, I am a big supporter of living simply, and I love that term, radically simplifying. Thank you. Thank you.